So you've got this Huntley, haven't you, on the telly. He's now in a safe house. He's done all these interviews. Well, the thing is, if you do an interview and you put yourself out there to the world, you know, big wide world out there, people looking, people on YouTube looking, someone's going to recognise you and someone's then going to come forward and say, hang on a minute, There's, he is not right, is he? He has done, there were so many, I think several, several Grimsbury residents said that they recognised Huntley from this TV, TV thing. Um, and also that he was, um, he had been accused of several rapes over, and, and several rapes, not just one and got away with it, several, over several years, different types, different people, he had got away with it. So now they know, hang on a minute, we have a rapist. We have a rapist on our hands now. But they didn't know at first. And then they find out, don't they, from this also, that even though Maxine Carl had said that she was in Stoneham that weekend, even though other people had tried to say, oh no, you was away, you was away. No, now you have the whole of Grimsby. People ringing up. No, she was here. She was out. She was in the pubs. She was there. So she can't be in two places at once. So now all their lies are starting to come down. All of them. Because these people are stupid, thinking that because they're sticking up for each other, I'll give you an alibi, you give me an alibi, everything's going to be okay. Well, it doesn't work like that. Evidence doesn't work like that. Especially when you're a rapist and you've attacked people. So people know your face. They remember your face. Now you've got Maxine Carr with a rapist. Really, he's not very well liked in Grinsby. People are going to remember your face. They're going to remember whether you was out or not. They know you. They're going to tell on you. And that's exactly what happened with this pair. So on the same evening that they was moved to this safe house, the police then conducted a much more thorough search of their home. Now this couple, when they was moved to safe houses, they were moved separately. They wasn't allowed to be together anymore. That was it. There was no more contact for them. They were now under investigation and there was no way they were going to spend any time together. So these were at separate different places to keep them well apart so that they couldn't make up any more stories. But at this point um, that the um, police were then searching the home in um, Stowham um, Village and in the college there, um, because this is where he was a senior caretaker and this is, wasn't his home, this belonged to the school. So there's, you know, they had rights to go in and they had rights anyway to go in because the man had lied. Uh, he was now uh, really 100% suspect with much more than circumstantial evidence I think coming at him at this point. And so was she. Um, so um, it had been really meticulously cleaned, this house. Meticulously cleaned. As I said before, he'd like flooded it to try and um, get rid of any evidence. Because people think that DNA is just water to get rid of DNA and stuff. Um, and it was like, as they said when they went in this, this house, you could smell this lemony, cleaning, fluidy stuff. It was just very lemony. So that there were artefacts found in this property. They were never made public. Now, you know, um, there's a reason. These children are young. Um, they didn't need that evidence, really. We didn't need to, you know, you know, it's on a need-to-know basis, I think, when you have victims so young. So there were artefacts found in this home um, of um, Huntley's. But, uh, and again, um, also included in, um, in the grounds of the skull, um, the items of clothing the girls have been wearing and last seen and that sort of thing. Um, there's, there's certain things been released but not everything. Um, I think we all know really what happened here. We've, you know, we've heard many of these cases before. We know where I'm going with this but you can't speculate really in this because we just don't know. So this photograph of these girls in this two Manchester United top this is some of the items that they were found at the, in the college grounds, in, this, in where he worked, in the school grounds where he worked. Um, they, we do know that the tops have been cut first, um, and we do know that, then that they were um, burnt or tried to be set alight and they were charred. So even though he tried to burn this stuff, destroy evidence of their clothing and stuff, there was fibres found 
on his um, on his clothing that matched um, the fibres from or provided by the clothing provided made a precise match to the clothing of um, Ian Huntley at that time and Huntley's body and also um, lots of clothing and articles and stuff they took from his home. Um, furthermore, his fingerprints were recovered from the bin. So where he had tried to get rid of all the stuff and burn it, they actually still recovered his fingerprints even after being burnt. They still got him on that. So on the 16th of August, Huntley's car was then um, taken away. Detailed forensic um, examination was um, because they needed to because we know he dumped these bodies. They knew he dumped these bodies. You weren't just going to walk down the street with two bodies. Even if you tried to burn them and everything else you've tried to do to them, you still have to get rid of these remains. And so they knew he had been in the car. And again, it was extensively cleaned this car inside and out. He'd also changed the tyres on his car as well. He'd done everything he could not to get caught. So there was this like brick dust, this like a it's a distinctive mixture of thick brick dust that was found in there. The back seat car covers, chair covers were missing. You know, there was a lots of stuff in this car that he couldn't get rid of because, you know, you can't get rid of everything. But he really tried, he they he really, really tried, you know, removed it, cleaned it, um, new tires, absolutely anything you could do to this car, he had done. So listen, having um found these children's clothing in this Stone Village College, police decided that they really now had to, you know, really arrest him, really charge him with this and car with this murder, because they both knew that they had done it. They just still hadn't found these bodies. They knew this, um, they, I think they arrested him under suspicion of um, abduction and of murder. And that was at 4.30 a.m. Um, on the 17th of August, 2002. That was when he was actually formally charged, and so was she, with um, suspicion of abduction and murder of Holly and Jessica. Listen, throughout all these interviews, you'll see him on the chair as he sits there and he's either crying or whatever, because they always do that. He was very evasive, he wouldn't answer any questions, there was no comment, he just wouldn't answer anything. Um, he was, he, he likes to appear to be a bit confused and this emotional, detached from things. Um, he usually looks quite sad face, like you, he wants you to feel sorry for him and stuff. He was, uh, you know, he was trying to forge the symptoms of mental health, but don't they all? Don't they all? Now either you've either got mental health or, or you haven't. And it's, you know, you can't have mental health just because you after you've killed someone so I've got mental health. It doesn't work like that. For one, you usually have a history of it, really a history of it that people would know about. Two, then you're also then assessed under the Mental Health Act if they even think you are um, and stuff. And so you, it's not really something. They think it, this is the mind of a criminal that thinks that he can get away with murder by saying, I am criminally insane. I've got mental health. You can't blame me. Well, you can blame you. And just because you've got mental health, most of the time now, that's not going to get you off. Because if you're medicated and don't take your medication, you're liable because you should have took your medication. If you know your danger and you stop taking that medication, then you are still liable. You may not go to prison, but you will go to a mental institution for the rest of your life. He was trying to get that, you see. I'm mentally ill. You can't put me into prison because you know no one likes do they a paedophile in prison we've had all this before and especially a murderer that's what he is but he's also a rapist he's already raped before um 4 30 a.m on the 17th of august 2002 ian huntley and maxine carl were formally really arrested um, and charged and with the suspicion of um, abduction and murder of Holly and Jessica, aged 10 at the time. At the interview, at this, uh, during this initial questioning and stuff, he was uh, very evasive, um, really wasn't answering questions, uh, refused to really. He appeared, um, you know, confused and emotionally distressed. Now we had heard before um, about his depression, hadn't we? Because 
remember we said about the neighbour that saw the mum's friend, the neighbour that saw them in the boot of the car. Um, he was very powerful. He was shaking and crying and 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 stuff. Um, he broke down quite a lot. I, 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 and he'd lost a lot of weight actually during this couple of weeks in this, whether that's stress or nerves of, of going to get caught, um, that's what it was. But by, by this stage, he was showing actually quite a lot of signs of being in some distress, I think. Um, and so he was drooling and, you know, you know, listen, people forge mental health, all right, all the time, because they think, if I've got mental health, I'm not going to be prosecuted for this case um, or I'm not going to go to prison or you know there's, there's lots of reasons why and it's very difficult sometimes if there hasn't been a history of mental health and usually if there has been a history of mental health and it's clear with some um, perpetrators there's a clear history of mental health and so they're not in their right mind and they're not capable of understanding what they're doing is wrong um, whether Ian Huntley come under that I wouldn't have thought so. Ian Huntley played the game quite well, I think, up until the point he got caught. He was, yes, he may have lost a bit of weight and he was worried, wouldn't you be, if you'd just murdered two children? And you think, you know, you've, you're, you've now got the whole country looking for you, really, when you think about it. Of course you're going to lose weight and be stressed over it. That would be a natural body response. But whether it's mental health or severe mental health, what he tried to claim it was, it's a totally different thing. So I think up until the day he was caught, Ian Huntley was fine. He was coping fine and yes, he had been put on a few antidepressants and some sleeping tablets because he couldn't sleep, but he was worried. He was worried about getting caught. Well, he should have worried about that before he murdered two girls. Because this man was already a rapist, don't forget. He got away with it. I think he actually thought he was going to get away with murder. I actually really do. I really believe that he thought, with her help, with her backing him, that he would get away with murder. And that's not how it works out. So because of this behaviour, up and down behaviour, you have to, by law, because you want to try and cover yourself. You want to try and cover that you're, you know, you've not done anything wrong in, in, in this. If this man looks like he needs some medical assistance or he needs to be looked at for mental health reasons then you must do that because you don't want to lose a case over that you want to make sure that what you're doing is right by him and so then you get a, a, the case that you want because the minute you start trying to say no he's not got mental health you're not a doctor he has to be assessed by two medical professionals uh, lots of other people to say whether he has mental health or not and whether he needs to be sectioned under the mental health act or not for his own safety or safety of others because at this point now this man actually has human rights that we have to look after i know it's true but that's the law or that's the law how it should be isn't it really and we discuss a lot of cases on here that that is not the way but in this case the police done everything right and they then um did um you know take him in and let him get referred to a mental hospital to undergo an extensive psychological evaluation. Um, by contrast, Carl, listen, Carl was so quick then to throw this man under the bus, she'd never done anything like it. She confessed to the detective that she'd lied um, about her whereabouts and that her, pet, you know, her partner's actions on the 4th of August. Um, um, you know, of course, she didn't know about it. If she'd known about it, she would have never lied to him. He said to her, or so she says, that he um, had already been under suspicion of rape somewhere else. And so that he, they, he knew if this had come up, you know, that he would be called in for this murder. And he told her that he'd washed the bed in and stuff because Jessica had had a nosebleed, so Holly came into the house, sat on the bed and helped Jessica with her nosebleed. Then in the bathroom, one of them hit their head, fell, the other one screamed, so he strangled her. That's what he said happened. Totally untrue. Um, and she says she believes all that and she only lied because really, you know, he would be, um, <laughs> he would be done for murder, wouldn't he? Of course he would, because he's a liar. 
So listen, Maxine gives all this spill about, you know, he told me, yes, but they came to our house and this, that, and the other, the nosebleeds and stuff. You know, and then they walked off. He actually didn't tell her he'd murdered them, so she says, I must have got that bit wrong. That's for later on down the line. Um, he, he says, that's what she says he that he done. So he was scared then he was going to get pulled into this, even though he had done nothing wrong. At 12.30pm on the 17th of August, uh, a gentleman named, um, he was a gameskeeper and it was Keith Parr, I think, or Prayer. Uh, he was 48 year old and he discovered the bodies, both of the girls lying um, side by side in about a five foot deep sort of ditch uh, close to a pheasant pen and um, and it was the perimeter of the RF base you see so really um, I think it's Lake and Heath in Suffolk um, it's about 10 miles east of Stoham so the thing is with usually with the Air Force bases people don't go on them you don't go near them you know you've got the you could have the fence and then you'd have the ditch and that so usually that sort of land that you wouldn't go on but you see he, Ian Huntley did he knew this area well really well now listen both these girls have been missing 13 days so they were in you know a state of very really de um, composition really uh, and also he had also tried to destroy you know evidence hadn't he on these bodies so you had that as well, you know, he wanted to, you know, any forensic evidence he was trying to destroy. Um, and then also he had either attempted to burn them bodies there or in that bin where the, and that where the clothes were. Um, there was no clear footprints or anything like that. There was nothing like that at the crime scene. Um, but despite this, him trying to destroy this evidence, um, and to really hinder this investigation, really, because they think, I think, perpetrators always think we won't know DNA and, and stuff. It, it, it's, it's hard to destroy, you know, DNA. It's, especially nowadays when you're going to have, you know, trace DNA. It's, it's so hard to destroy DNA all the time. Um, but they did um, deduce that there was two victims who were like, most likely to have been both, um, had not died in the location. So they knew the location of the bodies were different to where they had died. All right, they'd been dumped. They probably died at that home, and they they were dumped very quickly after and left out in the open for 13 days. So there were some hairs found, I think, on the bushes around the site of one of the girls, and so that's how they got the DNA off them. And I think it was the following day that the Cambridgeshire um, Deputy Chief Constable um, Keith Hodder, I think, released statement that it that it confirming that this was the bodies of um, the two girls um, so it's very sad really and it, it's very sad for the parents I think and that it, it really was but I think what comes next with this case is quite sad because this man should have never been allowed to work in a school so actually before I carry on with that I must say about Huntley, so I think he went to Rampton Secure Hospital where he was under um, observation and why he's under observation he cannot be um, questioned at, at all. Um, so he was formally charged with their murders and they knew what they were going to go for, it was now abduction and murder. Um, and I think she was charged with um, also um, preventing the course of justice. Um, um, that was Maxine Carr, and I think she was um, charged with further two counts of assisting an offender, and uh, I think on January 2003 when she went to court. But things changed with her, and her her charges changed a little bit, and we'll go into that as well in a little while. So Huntley had gone under all this, you know, mental health stuff. I'm going to, you know, try and get off with this murder and say that I'm insane and say I, you know, I'm suffering from mental health. You hear it a lot. So he's been assessed, and after that, they came back with, on I think, resulted on the 8th of October that Huntley was deemed that um, deemed mentally competent to stand trial. There was no psychiatric issues with Ian Huntley, apart from he was a psychopath and a sexual predator of children. So that was the only thing wrong with Ian Huntley. 
So then he was about to stand trial. So prior to the murders of um, Jessica and Holly, Huntley had established really an extensive record of uh, consensual and unconsensual sex uh, or sexual activity with females, um, many of whom had been beneath the legal age of consent. So I said about rape, and there was a few. Now I don't know how this man got away with so much. Maybe I don't know in the times what something was happening. In 1992 and, nine, and 2002, he had committed a numerous attacks of physical and sexual violence against women and children, for which he had been legally unpunished. Unpunished at all. I think he got a caution once. I think that's all he got. I think the youngest girl he actually raped was 12 years old. The 11 year old was a younger girl of 11, but she was attempted rape. For an 11 year old, even attempt is terrible. Attempted rape. Um, and, you know, 11 year old. Shocking, really. So this man had a history. So I don't understand how people didn't stop him. Yeah, I just don't get it. It's a string of it. There's a string of offences here. No one did nothing. He had many girlfriends as well, and many of them, probably all of them that had come forward and actually admitted that being with this man, had said that he was very domineering, he was very violent in the relationship. He'd start off very nice, you know, proper domestic abuser, this one. He'd start off normal, think everything was great, buy you flowers, take you out, be nice, very, very quickly. That changed, this man became violent. He was sexually violent as well. He, that's that's what motivated him was violence and sex that's what motivated this man he had no respect for women or children or anybody else this man he was a domestic abuser a violent rapist a violent child sexual predator and a paedophile that's what Huntley was all the way through these are just some of the cases that I'm telling you about that people have come forward with. As I say with rape, and especially rape of some of these younger girls, um, they don't come forward. They really don't. So we don't really know what else he'd done, but what we know he'd done is already enough. And that's before then he ended up murdering, murdering Holly and Jessica. Now, because of the laws were a little bit different, he was um, in Grimsby at the time and different places like that, moving around. His father had worked in different schools um, as a caretaker, so he thought, oh, I'm going to be a caretaker. So he then put in for a job as a caretaker into Stone College and got it. Now, this man had no experience either in that, but because he used a different name, you see, um, when he signed up to that, but even if he didn't, he had cautioned there wasn't really much on his record that was going to stop him getting a job with children, is it? The man really didn't have to, you know, change his name, but he did. So he knew, he was thinking, now the laws are different in this country. Now the law is everywhere, everybody, no matter what town you're in, no matter what county you're in, if you change a job. Actually, when I teach, my police check is I do yearly, so it, it, it's... Um, paid for but every time I get a job whether it's an hour teaching somewhere I have to they have to check that by law before I can step foot on my own into a classroom with them children uh, really it matters no age because a lot of the people you could have learning difficulties and stuff like this you need when you're working and teaching you have to have a clean record but also you have to have a system here and this wasn't in place at this time where it was this multi-agency system in place where we could pick up criminals like that. That's all different now. That wouldn't happen now. There's no way that you could use even a false name. They want every name you've ever had, every address you've ever had, every job you've ever had, your national insurance number, everything about you they want on these forms. Because one way or the other, they want to stop you before you get to where Ian Huntley got was so close to these children that they trusted him. They trusted him. 
these kids well no, was known not to trust strangers. Ian Huntley was not a stranger to them, was he? He was a caretaker of their school. He knew them. Maxine Carl was their not teacher. She was training to be a, um, a help in the class and she hadn't got the job. Um, but these people worked with children. These kids liked them. They trusted them. They're people they saw every day. These weren't strangers to Holly and Jesse, were they? They weren't. They knew them. And that's why he got as close to them kids as he possibly could. Now his excuse, or, or not excuse, I suppose, because he doesn't really say much about it, but I think what people theorise is, because this was a sexually motivated crime, okay, let's get that straight from now. This crime was sexually motivated. He, she had gone away for the weekend and he says that when she goes away and then she drinks, she gets flirtatious. And so they think because she was in Grimsby and he rang her up and said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm going out tonight. He became frustrated. He became ang angry. And then who did he see walking past his home as he's washing his dog? Holly and Jessica. And that's the theory that he likes to use of why he killed them. He killed them because he's a paedophile. He killed them because he wanted to kill them. There didn't need to be a reason. There's never a reason for these people to do what they did. He just did it because that's exactly what he would have done. And it's sooner or later, he would have escalated anyway, like he'd escalated there. Being a janitor or, you know, or a groundsman at this school gave him access to children. It gave a paedophile access to children to watch them every day, to know them, to get to know them, to befriend them, to have the opportunity. And that's all a paedophile needs, is the opportunity. And that's as quick as it was. These girls left their house at quarter past six. And by 10 to seven, Jessica's phone was turned off. They were already dead. So I think in February 1999 is when Huntley actually met um, or started to become acquainted with uh, Maxine Carl, who was 22 years old at the time. Um, and she was, um, I think there was in Grimsby nightclub, and actually she was with somebody else at the time. She had been drinking with her former boyfriend, and his name was uh, Paul Selby. And um, when he and Ian Huntley, this casual acquaintance of Selby's, walks in, and all of a sudden she drops Selby and she goes off of Ian Huntley that night. Um, you know, they, the two of them immediately like each other and are clinging to each other. And of course, if she's had a drink, because this is what Ian Huntley says about when she's had a drink, that she's anybody's really, uh, this is what she was well known for, Maxine Carl. So listen, within four weeks of meeting each other, this pair has moved in together. They're in love. In four weeks, they're now in a full-on relationship. They are living together. I think they get a one-bedroom or a ground floor flat. Um, in Scunthorpe, and then he proposed to her in the June of 1999. Now, as every abuser, let's be honest, in public, you know, he was um, besotted with her. You know, they were a besotted couple. They loved each other and this, that, and the other. In public, in private, he was really, um, really possessive, and also he was quite um, emotionally abusive and also physically abusive as well. To her on a number of occasions and often um, um, she sort of went off and back to live with her mother to get away from him but always seemed to go back. I think I think maybe it was her background I think where her lack of um, care for herself because that's all it can be is lack of care for yourself um, where she would allow someone to treat her like this and um, constantly in life for someone and, and, and do what she did. Um, it had to be something in her background that um, allowed her to think that this was a normal behaviour for her to do. So listen, she was born, I think, in um, Grimsbury, Lancashire in 1977, I think 16th February 1977. Uh, second of two daughters, born to Alfred, um, I think his name was Cab, and his wife, 
Shirley. So really the family regular experience financial difficulty. I think the father and mother split up and because it was quite that was quite a violent and volatile relationship there. And I think she didn't like her father that much and I think she changed her name actually in the end from um Carb to um Carl. Um, because she didn't want to be associated with him. But as an adolescent she was viewed by her peers as sort of someone that was an outcast really. She had very, very few friends as well, quite a loner really. I think I don't know if she wanted the attention but she just couldn't get it. People just didn't like her or they couldn't um I can't think of the word really, but they just couldn't respond to her. They they just sort of backed off and left her alone, even as quite a young child. Listen, she was always behind really in schoolwork. She really performed poorly in school, even though her ambition was to become a teacher at some day. You know, and you know, teaching's not easy and teaching you only need a lot of qualifications to teach it anyway. And I think, you know, I think she she tried to aim for it, but I think she found it really struggled. She found it very, very difficult, the, um, the academic side of it. And so that then again, I think, put her self-esteem down as well. Um, I think she was also overweight, and then she'd become very insecure about that, and this physical appearance, and she really started to um, get a really bit down and probably had some sort of mental health at a very early age. So I, I've read that she was, um, I think at 15, about 10 stone. So she was quite overweight for her size, her height and stuff. She was already struggling at school, now she felt that she was overweight, she wasn't coping, she wasn't mixing, um, she couldn't make friends easy. And then the eating disorder started, the mental health side of it started, the anorexia started at the age of 16. Her weight just plummeted, I think she went down to six stone. Now the thing is with anorexia, it affects the brain, okay, it's a brain disorder as well. It can do a lot of damage, you're starving your body of what it needs. And so it can really damage your body. It can stop your menstrual periods. It can stop them forever, really, if you continue to lose weight and do what you was doing. I think she got to a certain weight and um, I think she, her mother forced her to start eating. I don't know if they actually took her to medical doctors and stuff like that, but the mother actually forced her to eat. And actually, as she put on a little bit of weight, she sort of t started to maintain that weight and get on with it. But this left Maxine Carr very, very flirtatious. She seemed to like the attention of men. She it made her feel good. She seemed to need it. You know, she 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 needed that interaction with men to make herself feel good. And to tell the truth, I think any man would have done. And when she met um, Ian Huntley. Um, she thought he was very good looking, uh, he was charismatic to her, she felt he was everything that she had been looking for. But throughout their relationships there were affairs on both sides. So when she tells you something, even with Maxine Carl, you can't believe her. Maxine Carl will tell you what you want to hear to get herself out of something. And so will he. So yes, probably all this could be true. Uh, but you, I, you know, I wouldn't guarantee it, really. So anyway, then that's when she meets him and they move off to Soham because she wants to try and be this teacher and she's a teaching assistant, learning to be a teaching assistant. And she says, really, you know, that's all she ever wanted to be. And that's a relevant point, you see, when we now come on to the next thing about Maxine Carr, about how much and what she would do to still become a teacher what she would hold back just for her own gain. So in this case, let's sum up, because let's tell you about the aftermath really, because it's in the aftermath where we learn more about Maxine and Carl. But let me first tell you about this five cottage close, this home where these two girls were murdered. We don't know what happened to them, but they were murdered. This house was now, um, it's literally been destroyed, it's been demolished, and it's now just a patch of grass. Even this village could not even have this house standing there. No one wanted it there. It is literally gone. There is nothing there. And I think the other thing is, is that they didn't want people coming to the village to look at where it happened. So this house 
still is no longer there. It is literally was taken to the ground. There's nothing left. And I think a lot of people now, a lot of villages and towns, um, like uh, you know, April Jones's murder, they took the house down as well. Lots of people now are removing the sites of where these children were murdered. And a lot of it is one out of respect, but two to stop people visiting a crime scene, really. So I better say actually about Huntley's sentence. So I think it was on the uh, 17th of December 2003, Ian Huntley was charged, uh, was sentenced, sorry, to two terms, two life terms of imprisonment from the High Court. Um, and they later imposed a minimum term of 40 years. 40 years. Um, his girlfriend Maxine Carr, the girl, the teaching assistant, all you know, knowingly provided a false alibi. That's what she was arrested for and charged for. She received three and a half years in prison for conspiracy with Huntley to pervert the course of justice. Straight after this murder, this charge, this sentence that um, Huntley got, he just, he was, um, how could I say it? He was just screaming out to the media really about how bad it was for him, how bad his life was going to be that he would have to rot behind bars now, wouldn't he? Um, uh, <laughs> you know, I've never seen a man like Ian Huntley, who's so self-centred, self-served. You know, I've done, you've done two murders, you've took away two children's lives. But, you know, you're saying, I can't go outside anymore now, I'm going to have to be locked I'm up, I've been here now all my life. I mean, you know, did he really think it wouldn't happen to him that he'd get caught. I think it did. I think that's really what he thought because he'd got away with so many stuff. And I think the minute we start allowing predators like him to get away with rapes, you know, of a 12 year old or attempted rapes of an 11 year old or rapes of a 15 year old, there's many rapes he'd done, without getting prosecuted for it. You're building up, aren't you, in them, this feeling of empowerment in them. They're not going to get caught and if I get caught, I'm gonna get away with it. And I just, he really can't believe that he has got to spend 40 years in prison of his life for these crimes. He cannot understand it at all. He can't believe it. He's devastated. Actually, he's really pissed off. And he has been from day one about getting the sentence. Because he really doesn't think he deserves it. I think he thinks he should be free. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Ian Huntley is a paedophile, isn't he? So Ian Huntley, as I've said with many, many paedophiles before when they go into these prisons, they are attacked. Ian Huntley has been attacked so many times I can't count, really. He's continuously attacked or he's trying to kill himself or, or do something. But, you know, he, he is, he, he cannot believe, he says, that his life is torture in there. You're torturing him for putting him in prison for 40 years amongst people like that. Okay. But I always say, don't I, to all these you know, predators, probably ain't been caught yet. This is what you're going to get. Prison is torture for you. Of course it is. They took away your liberty because you took someone's life. As he and, you know, Ian Huntley seems to not be able to get that fact about that he's took two children's life and that's why his life is now torture these kids didn't have a choice their life was taken he had a choice he didn't have to do it but he did so in 2005 i think was his first attack where he, he was scalded with boiling water and i think that was by a fellow inmate and that was in um uh wakefield prison and i think the name of the inmate was mark hobson um he was injured and, you know, um, of course anyone you know, who's had boiling water thrown over them is going to be injured. Now, the second attack uh, of what we know of um, was, <laughs> now, how can I say it, because you're going to love this one. So the second attack, or the following attack after that one, was an attack in where he stated Ian Hunt is stated that the prison authorities um, have not 
they have found in their duty of care towards him. They should have protected him, which is true. It is, but I've said in many of these cases, our British prisons are very understaffed anyway, for a start. Lots of these prisoners are very, very good at what they do and at hiding stuff. It's very difficult to detect, so you can't blame the staff all the time. You can't blame it for lack of funding. You can't blame them for not being there um, as quickly to save you, but he did. And he won his court case of £15,000 in compensation. £15,000 in compensation. He won. Uh, he was reportedly awarded um, 2500 in legal aid to pursue this claim. So he even got legal aid to, <laughs> to sue the prison um, authorities, which is government run. So it's government money, taking government money and giving it to a private person. Ian Huntley that's been convicted of murdering two girls. Well, I think that compensation should go straight to his um, victim's fund, actually. He shouldn't have got any of it. So then uh, he was transferred from Wakefield um, to Franklin Prison on the 21st of January 2008. And three years later, on the 21st of March, he was attacked again. So he was slashed and um, around the throat and the face, I think, um, and, and it, by a convicted armed robber. Um, that actually attacked him this time. Um, it wasn't real serious injuries, but it was superficial injuries. The injuries that Huntley received to attack, the hospital treatment and stuff were needed, but it wasn't serious, it, it wasn't that close to his neck. I think I think the man wanted to, I think his name was um, Damien Fawkes, I think he wanted to kill him, because there's, you know, as I said before, there's hits and everything out on these people in these prisons, but he couldn't get to him. So I think he'd done what he could. But again, you know, um, Huntley's been attacked again in another prison. Now, <laughs> again, he's also seeking damages for this injury as well. And he's also trying to sue for compensation for these injuries, again, for lack of duty of care to protect him from other prisoners from the police authorities of £20,000. I don't know if that one went through because on the 5th of September 2006, I think, it, you know, it, it definitely had enough. He'd had enough of, of continually trying to be attacked and it would have gone on and gone on. And he attempted suicide by taking an overdose of antidepressants that he'd accumulated himself in his prison cell. So again, we can't, you haven't got prison officers there that can't watch these prisoners 24 hours a day. They can't also watch and, and do, you know, searches on their prison cells to see what stuff they've got in there and Huntley had lots and lots and lots of anti-depressants um, in there that he had saved up for a special occasion as he calls it. But it was at this, you see, this time, this suicide, not any of the other attacks, this suicide. No, he survived, he was taken to hospital and he survived the attack as we all know. But it was what they found in his cell, you see, when they then did the search of the cell, because even though he's in hospital, they need to know where has he got this medication from, these antidepressants, where's he hiding it, where's his hiding place? Oh, they didn't find medication. They found a video tape or a, a tape recorder, a recording tape. Now Huntley had recorded everything on there about Maxine Carr and stuff like that. Um, to which he, you know, he's, <laughs> he just put everything on there. Not because he wanted to be great and he wanted to tell the truth and he wanted, if he died, to, you know, to have the truth out there, you know, to help this family and, and, and stuff. No, he was, it was arranged that another prisoner, um, once he was dead, would go into the cell, retrieve the tape recording and sell it to the press for money. That's what that was all about. But there was stuff on there about Maxine Carr and her real involvement in this crime. So Ian Huntley states in this deathbed really I suppose confession tape you could call it because he actually did want to commit suicide that's what he tried to do as far as he was aware by the time anyone heard this you know tape recording he would be dead wouldn't he that's it he's dead the man makes the money everyone is happy that's what he thought but he said about um, having murdered both the girls but he also said that he had told 
Maxine Carr prior to this arrest, prior to any of that, to his arrest, that he planned to confess. He said to her, I'm going to confess to these murders. He'd confessed to her he'd done it. And he was going to confess. And she, he says in this tape, she said, no, you can't do that. You can't do it. So she slaps him around the face and tells him to pull himself together, sort himself out, sort this out, sort your mess out. That's what Maxine Carr told him to, say, to do. Sort your mess out. You see, he states that she didn't want to lose her teaching position that she had yearned for for years. And if this come out, that he had murdered these two girls, where would that leave her? So it's said that she's the one that told him where to hide the bodies somewhere they would never be found because this was land that no one should have gone on you see but listen we're in England you know people don't care I mean I walk them dogs across so many fields I don't know who owns them I don't know I don't see any signs how would you know but she he because he went there he just didn't he he needed somewhere to put them bodies where they thought no one was going to ever find them he also states in this tape that Carr, Maxine Carr, the girl that only done three and a half years in prison and then is out, told him to burn them bodies, destroy any evidence, any DNA evidence on them bodies. So the thing is with Carl, Maxine Carr, yes, she's a woman. Yes, she was teacher or she was a teaching assistant with these kids. She knew these kids, and as you've seen by her clip, she's holding up the card, you know, of from the kids. This is a woman that's told Ian Huntley to burn them, get rid of them, pull himself together, slapped him, because she wants to be a teacher. Now, does this sound to you like someone who has been through domestic abuse with this man? Does she seem like someone who this man could control, put down, overpower? Because that's what she wanted you to believe. This is what she wanted the prosecution to believe. And they believed her. You see, they believed her. Because this tape didn't come out till 2006. It was too late then. She'd been tried. She was out. She was out. Three and a half years later, the girl's out. And the girl's out. And of course she's out with a new identity. And that identity for her and her family cost between one and five million pounds. But then that's not enough for Maxine Carr, you see. So she's out, we can't touch her. She's living a new life, God knows where she is. Who cares, we don't. That's not the last of her. She's had all that. Then she approaches a publishing company to write her autobiography. Her autobiography, you know, and to sell that for money to make more money off this. She hasn't even really, I think, justice has not been served here for Maxine Carr. There's a lot more to Maxine Carr than Maxine Carr wants you to believe. Ian Huntley didn't say anything about Maxine Carr at his trial. He took the blame. He didn't say it until he thought he was going to die. That's when he said it. He left it on a tape recording. So I don't believe that Maxine Carr was ever, ever abused by this man. I just don't believe it. Because many of you out there, and we talk about many domestic violent cases, don't we? Domestic homicides, we talk about these all the time. Her personality does not seem to me like someone that had gone through that. This girl was in control. This girl's doing, this girl's telling him, this is what's going to happen. If she was domestic abuse, this was her way out, wouldn't it have been? The minute that man told you he'd murdered someone, really, you'd think, thank God, I'm out of here. 
he's going to go to prison for a very long time. Not Maxine Carl. Hide it. Slapped him. Pull yourself together. Burn the bodies. Get rid of them bodies. Get rid of the evidence. Does that, it, to me, Maxine Carl is as bad as he is. She really is. Because these families, if them bodies by accident hadn't have been found, that's the only reason they were found by accident. Really. These people still could have been wondering where their children were all these years later if Maxine Carr had had her way and if Ian Huntley had such more sense than she thought he had. So listen, this has been the Soham case. It's a shocking case, isn't it, really, when you think about what's happened to these poor children. And then you have Ian Huntley and Maxine Carr, one in prison for 40 years. Can't believe he's in there. Can't, you know, can't stand it. You've ruined my life. My life's terrible in here. Really. But then you've got Maxine Carr, new life. One to five million pounds worth of it, her and her family. And then wants to go on and sell her story to make more money. Well, I tell you, there was such an uproar when it came out about Maxine Carl wanting to sell her story that that publishing deal fell through. Because I can't see anybody wanting to publish that woman's story, that woman's lies, because that's what she is. She's an absolute liar. And she should still be in prison the same as he should have been for what she's done. It's really terrible really really bad so listen you know what to do subscribe 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 however you want to do it i, I need one of these things on the bottom of the screen don't i anyone knows how to do it let me know you know they like subscribe and then they bounce all these things i can't do it because i'm no good at that sort of thing someone help me please um you know what to do so you can follow us on instagram and you can follow us on um, facebook you can also catch this case coming up on Let's Have a Chat About Murder on Spotify. So thank you, my partners in crime, for joining me. I hope you found this case interesting. I like to see all your comments, and I'll be speaking to you soon. So until the next time, bye-bye.